Monsignor Paul Francis Bradley, or as he was better known during World War II, Father Bradley or the Padre. This is an extra special edition of the Voices of History channel. Father Bradley and I became friends in the twilight hours of his life, in his last few months on this earth. I met him in 2005, February, Long Ranch, New Jersey at his home. He was a pastor for over 60 years. He served his community faithfully. He served during World War II, Korea, and the Vietnam War. So I know him more through World War II and the Battle of Iwo Jima. He was the chaplain for the 5th Marine Division on Iwo Jima, and his story is remarkable. I actually have two interviews with him. This is his second interview that I did. He died in July of 2005. I was in the procession to Brooklyn, New York, and have his graveside service, and it's featured in my film, Father Bradley Remembered, A Journey of Faith. So Father Bradley, we honor you today, sir. And I can't say enough about Father Bradley. He's one of the most charismatic priests I've ever known. And I actually have his last Ash Wednesday Mass on video, but Father Bradley was gung-ho to the end. He's 91 years old. He couldn't really even see. He was pretty much blind when I came into his life. And he turned down many major interviews over the years with major networks, but he opened his heart to me, and you're going to hear his story. I'd like to thank Mr. and Mrs. Sebastian Tier up in Ottawa, Canada. Oh, God bless you, too. I've never met you on this earth, but thank you for your heart and, and, and your heart to remember this story and all stories from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. This story in particular is especially special to me because I've always been intrigued by the spiritual side of combat. You know, how do men die on the battlefield? Father Bradley talks about that. He was around them as they died, as the Marines died in Iwo Jima, gave last rites to a lot of them, and I don't want to give it all away, but this is one of the best stories that I've ever recorded. Father Bradley, I love you. He's in my heart always, and I miss him dearly. So again, Sebastian Tier and your wife, thank you for sponsoring this story. And I'm really proud and excited to bring it to you here on the Voices of History channel. And folks, like I said, you know, these are first-hand accounts from those who were there. And if you'd like to help sponsor one of these stories, just get a hold of me. There's information in the video description and in the comment section. So, okay, without further ado, I present to you Father Bradley or Monsignor Paul Francis Bradley. Hope you really enjoy this story and share it. Subscribe to this channel. Let's keep this thing going, folks. These stories are paramount in this day that we live in. We need to hear these stories. Our children need to hear these stories because it's freedom, being fought for, freedom being earned, and it's what makes our country great and our friends in Canada too. So we, we pray for both of our countries as we go forward. And like I've said before, we're fighting for the same freedoms in our own countries that our veterans fought for. So God bless you. Thank you for watching. Basically, tell me about being with the 5th Marine Division on Iwo Jima, how that came about, and and then we're going to eventually just, I want you to tell me what you remember about going in with the troops that day on Iwo. So what do you remember about maybe the night before the landing? Where were you? Did you have a prayer service on board? Well, um, we left Camp Pendleton and proceeded to San Diego and got on an a, a troop ship, an APA. And... Um, we followed at that time a zigzag course uh -huh. to avoid the Japanese submarines. And um, we stopped off for a few hours at Saipan. Uh -huh. And uh, I got word from the beach that there would be some undersea men going up to Iwo before we would in land and they wanted to go to confession so I got off the APA went ashore and took care of about a half a dozen men that turned out to be underwater uh, whatever you call them now yeah yeah I know and um, they would clear the the approach to the beach I believe that would be it mm -hmm. of enemy 
of any enemy. So uh, then on the morning of uh, the 19th of February, we went down a rope ladder mm -hmm. and got into um, a landing craft and um, proceeded to the black sand of Iwo Jima. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe it was on the north side of uh, Mount Suribachi. I, uh, my mask kit and gear was carried by my faithful bodyguard, Max Hayfley, mm -hmm. out of Topeka, Kansas. A lad that later on I introduced to his present wife of 56 years, I believe. And the father of about a dozen kids. Well, anyway, Max helped me along and um, under a hail of fire, we landed and I was um, climbing up on, like uh, it was a, a high ridge of black sand. Mm -hmm. And um, very difficult because it would be nothing to hang on, it would be sliding down from the sand, but finally got on under fire. And um, then once we got on the beach, I uh, had some men calling for me. And there were men that had already been shot, wounded. And um, they recognized me on account of I wore a, a gold cross on the um, brim of my um, baseball cap on the peak. Mm -hmm. And um, there was some crying out for me and one famous lad whose name I'll not mention because his from a famous family in the far west. Uh, and he said, Father, I'm not a Catholic, but I want to be baptized. That's how we withhold his name. Anointed him, and he died while I was there. But while I was attending to him, and he was lying on his back, he took a shot in the must have been the stomach area where it sounded to me. And that's what really killed him. It was like a plump. And he shook. The other, some other experiences. I went from uh, man to man. And you'll find in um, some of the literature that I have where a, a doctor at the, the first night at the foot of Surabachi he explained that the Padre was providing a care that at that particular time there was nothing there as medics could do to help with the morale and covering from man to man. I think I knew the man in the 28th quite well. I'm still a close friend of Dave Severance, Colonel Severance who was the commanding officer of Easy Company, the company that put the flag up on Surabachi. I think one of the, uh, uh, well, it's like a, a tear-jerking uh, memory. When I came across about three or four men that were uh, in flames, they were a flame-throwing squad and even though they had been well instructed, once they pull the trigger, if it doesn't ignite, don't pull it a second time, other the atmosphere would be in, would envelop, be enveloped with flame. Apparently, they violated that precept. And as they went from man to man, they were dying, but they were still conscious. And I had anointed each one. It was very hard to find a place where I could anoint because of the fire. Of the, their bodies were so tortured. Uh, I anointed each one, and as I'd go from one to the other, I could hear something that I didn't hear too much of in 
civilian life. As I leave the first one and tending to the second one, the first one be saying, in a dying voice, thank you, Father. The same thing happened with the second man when I went to the third. It's a memory that I'll never forget because sometimes in life we forget to say thanks, but this was a time there was no thanks required or expected or anticipated. The 28th was just a great outfit, commanded by a great colonel by the name of Harry, Colonel Harry Libesedge. Mm -hmm. We had an executive officer called Stick Williams. He was a lieutenant colonel, I believe. Called him the stick because he always had a swagger stick with him as he went. But however, I recall one time going by his foxhole, and it was about the third day on the beach or on the island. And kneeling in his foxhole, he was shaving with a straight razor with a hand mirror stuck in the sand. I believe Colonel Williams had been a paratrooper, Marine paratrooper at Bougainville, I believe. He might have been at Guadalcanal too. He was a great warrior, as all Marines are. Now listen, Larry, that's about it. Now don't forget, at the time, being a novice with regard to warfare, in my mass kit, the equipment to be able to say mass, I didn't have a ciborium. That would be a container for the Blessed Sacrament for hosts, for communion. And as a result, there were a couple of days on the Ewo that I said more than four and five, six masses because I had a concert for, for Holy Communion, a priest can only consecrate hosts in the sacrifice of the mass. So the troops wanted to receive Holy Communion in the, the, this critical time, but they had been well prepared. I had a mission for them before we left Camp Pendleton. And um, allowed them to know that the best warrior and the best soldier, Marine, is when he's not afraid to face God, when he's in the state of grace, ready to meet God. And therefore, my Catholic personnel kept me quite busy before and during, and I had general services for Protestants, for non-Catholics, and for Jewish personnel. And of course, the regiment had a great Protestant chaplain, an evangelical Lutheran, I believe, by the name of Reverend Glenn Bauman. Reverend Glenn Bauman. He was very well liked and respected by all hands. I believe he's now deceased. Can I ask you a couple questions? Yes, sir. Well, again, did you landed with the 5th Marine Division. Yeah, with the 28th Regiment, okay. which was yes. a rifle regiment. Mm -hmm. And I was in the, um, according to the uh, Max Hafley, we were in the first wave, but I thought it was the third wave okay. hitting the beach. Well, again, Monsignor, tell me again the, the mood of the troops the night before or going in that day, um, were they scared? Were they turning to you for, for comfort? What were they, were, were you saying any prayers with them? What were you doing going in? Well, we had uh, a few uh, spiritual meditations and prayer. Mm -hmm. And I had been quite close to the troops, I think, because uh, originating in Brooklyn, when I got to the West Coast, there was little more that I could do than to experience and the joy of being associated with these great guys. 
I would say the morale was very high. Nobody came wavering or indicating any, indicating any serious uh, fear. They had respect for and the sense of obligated duty to God, to country, of being a great Marine. Can I ask you, when you were on the, uh, how many days were you on the island, the whole 36 days? Well, we landed on the 19th, that was D-Day. Right. And I believe it was the 26th of March that I left the island. Okay, so you were there the whole time. Right. Yeah. Can you tell me, or remember, um, again, I'm curious, when you gave last rites to a dying Marine, yeah. can, you, can you just tell me what you said? Well, in a in, um, anointing with the sacrament of extreme unction, last rites, it would be a, the form is in Latin at that time. They now use English. Anoint you with the oil of salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord to bring you on your journey to eternal life. These men, as I think I mentioned with the flamethrowers, they were so appreciative. None of them, uh, there was no tears. They died as they lived. Strong. Adhering. To, I think, um, the virtues learned long before from their good parents, from their families, the ones that were married and leaving children behind. They accepted the conditions required of being appreciative of living in the greatest country in the world, America the beautiful. Approximately, Monsignor, how many, how many Marines do you think you perform last rites for? A hundred, five hundred, what do you think? Well, I never really kept count, but I know that I, um, after the war, after we got back to Camp Tarawa on the Big Island of Hawaii, I wrote at least uh, some odd hundred letters mm -hmm. to the next of kin. I had kept a census from the time I got assigned to the 28th Regiment. Did Back you, in the latter part of 44, or August or September, I think, mm -hmm. of 44. Can I ask you what your thoughts were to God regarding what you saw and felt during that time and in your quiet time? What kind of prayers were you praying to God? I'd pray for all the souls that are now deceased of all those who had already passed on, that had given up their lives for God, for country. My normal night prayers of the Our Father and the Hail Mary, act of faith, hope, love, act of sorrow, contrition. And asking for God's grace and blessing upon the whole unit of the 5th Division, the 28th Regiment, and the other regiments in the division that were committed, along with the, the elements of the 3rd Division. Did you work with the corpsmen? I mean, were the corpsmen treating the wounded and you were at their side during this time? 
Yes, at uh, certain, I guess they call them, I don't know what they call them, hospital stations or... Uh, Battalion aid stations? Yeah. Uh, I forget whether we're company aid stations mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Did it ever become routine for you, or was it always a very personal experience when you gave last rides? I, I felt that it was just the... I thank God I was on the... with the opportunity to carry out the obligations of my priesthood. Had you ever been in a situation like that prior to Iwo Jima? No. What do you think, looking back 60 years now, what does Iwo Jima mean to you today? I hope it will always remain as a beacon of light to the citizenry of our great country that we'll be loyal to God and loyal to our great president and to fulfill the obligations of serving America, to defend it at all costs. Otherwise, the Heroes and the deceased of World War II will have been in vain. We must never, never forget their heroic actions of the Marine Corps, the U.S. Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, Wait. and the Air Force. Okay. When you, when you went into the, the beach that day, were you conscious of the fact that a lot of these men may be killed, wounded, and oh, yes. would be at their side? Yes, and I never forgot that um, I could be one of them. Mm -hmm. However, I don't think that it ever deterred me from making every effort to fulfill my obligated duties to God and country and to these great men that I had gotten to admire and respect. Were you fearful of your life, like you said? Were you afraid going in? Were they shooting at you, obviously, too? I think it flashed in my mind a bit, but as I look back, and even shortly after the whole operation, uh, it seems contradictory, but I remember, I think I felt that I'd never be hit. One time, not having been trained as a military man, I thought the front lines would run straight across. And I remember leaving a few men that belonged to a certain squad, I think in B Company, and I was, I took care of them, and then I crossed over, and I found out I was in a pocket between B Company and another company. So I played dead at that time. I was being sprayed with small fire, and it was kicking up the sand around me or the dirt. Mm -hmm. And as I looked back later on and remember that, I said, "Gee, here I am." A priest, and I never thought to say a prayer at that time. So were there other prayers you would pray, or was it just the, the last rites that you would say? Oh, no. Well, I was saying Mass. Yeah. Right, right there on the island? Oh, sure. Uh -huh. what, what was, were the men scared at that time, or were they coming out of duty, or how did they feel, you think, when they came to you? Did Protestants come to the service? Protestants... Well, we were scattered, you know, mm -hmm. and um, there was no real concentration of um, personnel where we 
be a perfect target to the, for the enemy. What, what kind of words would you share with the men during one of those services uh, with the battle raging? Very few words. Trying to encourage them. I remember one time, I can't think of... Oh, I think he was a singer on um, the Lucky Strike Parade at that time. Very well known. If I could think of his name before we depart. Well, anyway, the day before we went in, I had mass up on the forecastle, and there was they were crowded all over. Up there's a picture there of the troop ship. They were up on the gun mounts and so on and so forth. So I gave a talk, which just came naturally, I guess. I said, now men, this is at the end of Mass, you have nothing to worry about, nothing to be afraid. Today you received Holy Communion at this Mass. When we hit that beach, God will be with you and you have nothing to be afraid of. So later on, I was over by the uh, side rail on um, port side. And... Uh, this officer, junior officer came up to me and said, uh, I said, oh, I said, oh, have you got a light? I was smoking at that time. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, sure. Then this young officer said, by the way, Padre, if you said we have nothing to worry about, God is with us, why don't you get to a safe place like going back to um, Oceanside, California. If you have faith, you said you could walk on the water. So I said I would accept some Don Fool would probably follow me. But anyhow, bro, what was the name of the... Dennis Day. Dennis Day. Dennis Day was the one that came up to me John Bassalone belonged to the 27th Regiment, okay? But I, uh, before we went overseas at Oceanside, California, he had been attending my mass at, at the 28th area. So he um, became engaged, I think, to a, a Marine young lady who was, in, I believe, as I recall, in the Supply Corp. I married them down at, um, I believe it was St. Mary's Church in Oceanside, California. Mm -hmm. This is before, naturally, before we shoved off. He was over at the first Japanese, or Iwo Jima, airstrip on the first day, I believe it was, as I recall, when he was shot and killed. I was killed on the first day, as I remember, mm -hmm. but I wasn't with him at the time. He had gone to the other side of the island, as the 27th did, mm -hmm. and the 28th we got on the island, and um, we worked, I think, towards Surabachi at the time before, and after Surabachi was secured, we then went north. He was a great, brave, faithful Marine. And it was my privilege after the war, at the invitation of the family, his loving f brother or sister and mother, and f oh, I believe just the mother maybe, to have attended Johnny Bassalone honor days, celebrated. Did, did, did these men make their peace with God before they would pass? Or, I mean, how did you feel about the fact? And, and would, would they just close their eyes and die? Or would you even be at their side when they did die? I was many times, I was with many when I was at their side when they breathed their last. To the imminent danger, the death is very uncertain. 
It can happen to the young and to the old. We know not the day nor the hour. But the word is to be ready. As we are ready as Marines, we are to be ready as soldiers of Jesus Christ. That's the definition of the sacrament of confirmation. To make us strong and perfect Christians and soldiers of Jesus Christ in the sense of being capable of defending our faith and be responsible for our actions in thought, word, and deed. Well, if they're still conscious, naturally identify myself in the event they've been blinded or being maybe a little, some of them semi-conscious maybe, or they're aware that they've been, they've been mortally wounded or seriously wounded. I naturally say a few comforting words and giving them courage. And that um, we say together, my Jesus mercy, The mercy of Almighty God outweighs all the evil in the world because the, God is infinite. When I come across them and if they're anyway conscious, semi-conscious even, I would talk loud and clear as much as I could. I, I asked all the veterans this question, Monsignor. What, what, what does freedom mean to you? Freedom to, to live, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and forbids the murder of the killing of a human in the womb of the mother. Now, on the Battle of Iwo Jima, you saw a lot of Marines die. What would you tell a young person today about the price for freedom? Thanks to their hero heroic death, to their courage and bravery and their love of their fellow man, we must thank God and thank them for enabling us to defend our liberties, our freedom to know God, to respect human life, to respect all members of the human race, regardless of color, ethnicity, and religious fervor. Can I ask you a question about the training or the preparation for Iwo Jima? Who, you know, the Marines were trained. Were you trained with the Marines or were you just, I mean, you were attached with the Marines, right? Right. Okay, what, yeah. what type of guidance did you have going into that campaign as far as what, what to expect? Shortly after graduating from chaplain school, was located at William and Mary College, Williamsburg, Virginia. Shortly after graduation, I was assigned to the 5th Marine Division, Camp Pendleton. When I arrived at Pendleton, they had already cut my orders to be the chaplain of the 28th Regiment. From the time I arrived at, um, as the chaplain of the 28th until my detachment from the 28th on the 26th of March, 1945. Was it hard for you to talk about the war after the war? A lot of these men wouldn't talk about it, what they saw. Was it hard This is the you? most I've ever talked about it. And I do appreciate your interview, sir. Um, I think for future generations who will see this as a legacy of what has happened and the fact that freedom is not free, I, I thank you for, for this opportunity. And uh, uh, a lot of the men I've spoken with have, have talked very highly of you. Uh, Greg Emery, um, Charlie Waterhouse, Al Abatello, some of these men that I've interviewed have spoke of you. And I... This is the first interview that I've had with a chaplain at Iwo Jima or Normandy, Omaha Beach in France. I've, I've not been fortunate enough to speak with 
anybody. And so this, this interview means a lot to me, and I wanted to thank you for, for that, sir. Our listeners, thank you. I'll tell you what, though. I have been asked many times to be interviewed, and you know what? This was, let's say, shortly after the war, mm -hmm. but I was still in the service, see. I uh, enjoyed talking with you and meeting University. Monsignor, you, you walked through the cemeteries at Iwo Jima, did you? Oh, I sure did, and blessed the graves. Can you tell me a little bit about what you remember about that? Yeah, there was a chaplain, a rabbi by the name of Chaplain uh, Gittleson, I think Gittleson. He gave a talk at that cemetery that um, I knew him when we were at um, the Marine camp on the big island of, uh, of Hawaii. The next time I saw him was when we were blessing the cemetery on Iwo. Mm -hmm. Since that time, there have been bodies brought back to the States and on a couple of occasions, I've been called by the next of kin survivors for me to attend a wake service or something like that, or a memorial service, which I've done. Can you tell me what you meant by blessing the graves? What would you do? Is that a formal thing, or you just walk through the... the that we do for any um, burial that we have. I had one yesterday. You bury the... You bless the grave, which will now contain the mortal remains of... John Doe, until that day, the resurrection of the life, Christ will rise and raise us from the dead. Mm -hmm. What were your thoughts when you walked through the cemetery? You saw all these crosses. What were your thoughts then? I mean, of all these men that had died. I'll, I'll tell you one. It, I was thankful that it gave me an opportunity to remember them again in prayer as I blessed each grave. Is there a particular moment that stands out in your mind as far as the wounded or the dying at Iwo Jima? Are there maybe one or two that really stand out among all of them or they, were there, was there anyone that stood out as far as the situation, the last rites? And no, I found them all great, but I have a brave and courageous and dying well and with the grace of God. And uh, some of these wounded, were eventually evacuated, all right, to a hospital ship or to, mm -hmm. to get them off the island. When I got back to camp, as I think I indicated earlier in this discussion, that I wrote to the next of kin a letter of condolence or this, this, that, and how well he served and died for God, country. I had a great letter back from the father who was a fire officer in San Francisco. The com camaraderie of the men in the 28th forces me to report to you right now. There was a lad, I believe his name was Fleming, and he was a buddy of a communication, they were both in communications, wire laying, whatever. And um, his buddy was shot and killed instantly. And this guy Fleming, when he found out his buddy, and it happened not from, far from us at the time, he ran out after <laughs> yelling at the Japanese, and boy, he took one right now. If you see what I'm trying to get at, the respect they had for each other. One man that I saw actually give up his life. He ran out into the open because his body was shot and killed. Now when I left the uh, First Marine Air Wing in 1965, Iwo Kuni, Japan, the commanding general was Paul Fontana, a great guy. He's now deceased, Lord rest him. Not from combat. And I would say that uh, I hear from some of those people, and I don't forget, I was only with them maybe 13 months. But when I left them, they put on tape my farewell, and I directed them to my friends in the brig, and I had a few guys that were locked up. 
There's not much left of me, of the boy I used to be. I live in memories among my souvenirs. A gutter black and blue, then there's my appendix too. I find a bruise from you among my souvenirs. There are some bones within my broken chest. The docs will do their best at my next operation. They'll tear me all apart. So now before they start, I place a broken, deleted, by reason of my memories. <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's great. Could I ask you to do um, actually a couple things quickly? At the end of my interviews, not that I'd still want to talk to you later, but at the end of this interview now, at the end of the interviews with all the veterans in their homes, I, I asked them to give me a salute into the camera. These are all veterans now. Could I ask you to do that for me too? Yes, sir. Let me, let me turn the camera on you and just if you can, just give me a salute into the camera. Should I stand up? No, right where you're at now. Go ahead. Great.